Thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, it, it's good to see you here again. I know um, we are living that Groundhog's Day, and I, I wanna say that I do feel a little bit, myself even, of some of the frustrations at times, um, the not knowing, the tolerance for ambiguity we have talked about. We know that we're in that sort of flat spot right now at the top of our peak, our first peak, hopefully the biggest thing we'll face. But I, I know it's hard to keep doing what you're doing and I wanna talk a little bit about that. But first of all, let's take a look at the numbers today. Um, we do now have 7,280 cases in Ohio and a total in Ohio of 324 deaths. We did see, um, I believe, approximately 50 deaths just in the last day. We have cases now in 86 of our counties of 88. Um, and I realize this is tough because as we are really relieved that we have peaked at a really steady low level that's not overtaxing our hospitals, all in part, in all really in due part to you and the work you're doing and, and the the resiliency you're showing in holding out and continuing to do the social distancing. We do know that um, there are a lot of losses and there's a lot of sickness going on. And so I just want to acknowledge that these are, are still really tough times for, for many out there. Um, next slide. Again, we've done 67,000 tests over that in Ohio. Um, and our stats are pretty much holding the same in terms of age ranges and the distribution of who's getting sick. Obviously, we continue to see, next slide, um, our trend's pretty steady with the exception, you know, and we're gonna have these spikes, we're gonna have bad days and good days, and we're, we're really looking for trends, we're looking for directional trends. We really need um, to move forward you know, and make the next set of decisions we need to make, we're really needing to see those trends stay down and stay steady for a sustained amount of time. Next slide, please. I just wanted to remind everybody about high-risk categories. And of course, we've talked a little bit about vulnerable populations, the homeless, folks that are living in congregate settings. Um, but also, I just wanna talk about the risk factors for each of you. Now remember that anyone can really have, even a healthy person, a difficult time fighting off this virus. But certain folks are more at risk. Again, chronic lung disease, that's people with COPD, asthma, people who smoke or are exposed to higher levels of pollution, we're now seeing that that is a risk factor. Um, asthma, heart conditions, people who are immunocompromised for a variety of diseases or on cancer-treating drugs. Um, obesity itself, um, is a risk factor, diabetes, kidney disease, and liver disease. This is what we know so far from the science, obviously aging, more at risk for any disease you're fighting off. So, you know, we know that um, there's prevalence, if not for us, uh, for those we love. And so we're doing a lot to keep those folks safe as well. Next slide. Okay. So I wanna talk about a new order that has been issued and again, in partnership uh, with our mayors and listening to the needs at the local level, as well as with our frontline responders, we know how essential it is to protect our EMS, our firefighters, uh, the folks who are first on the scene. I wanna add in the State Highway Patrol, their new group that's particularly near and dear to my heart. And it's really important with the lack of PPE we have, the, the protective gear, that we're protecting those frontline workers who are often responding when someone is not doing well. Part of this order is that we are sharing more widely, but in a very confidential way, um, the addresses of folks who are cases. And this order protects that as confidential information for our dispatchers to make sure that folks are properly protected um, when they're transporting someone who may have COVID-19. I do wanna add though, and this is very important, so for our frontline responders, remember that anyone might be carrying the disease. Even someone who has recovered can still be potentially shedding the disease. 
It's so important, and as we move forward, we're gonna be talking about universal masking, but you have to assume, even as a frontline responder, I wanna know that you have at least this. Um, I know you're gearing up extra for certain circumstances and you're trying to save and conserve that gear, but everybody should have this. And for those of us who are at home, um, making them, finding one, even a simple bandana or a scarf, there's lots on our website, but we really have to protect each other. And I'll be sharing more in days to come how I wanna make sure that every Ohioan has, has this kind of mask available to them, that no one's left behind. So there is an EMS order that was issued today. Now I wanna talk, we're gonna be talking a lot more, but I know in the media there's much discussion about the plans. We're making a plan here in Ohio. We've been working on it for weeks, not just on the recovery phase, but we've also built out, as Mayor Ginther talked about, and, and the governor as well, just an unprecedented level of partnership between our hospitals, our nursing homes, and others in our community, especially our local health departments, and how we respond to what we expect to be ongoing hotspots and flare-ups throughout our state. The way I talked to Johns Hopkins, um, a colleague there who helped write one of the suggested plan sort of elements. We've been studying every possible plan and guidance out there. Um, and he said, Ohio should be tremendously proud. We really, really um, have been a leader and we've won the first battle in a war. We've won the first battle. I think one of the things that's hardest for me, and I know it's hard for you out there, is that this is a war. We have won the first battle, but we can't stop there. This is a longer road, and there are other battles yet to fight. So we continue to build, just like the convention center, but other spaces. We have to have our capacity ready in our hospitals, because we're hearing now from the scientists that we could see ongoing spikes until we have a vaccine. We are building out our emergency command to deal with those spikes and come alongside locals to help in any way we can. But most of all, we continue to look to you. As we talk about the very slow, gradual, responsible walk to opening up some parts of what we do, doing that very responsibly, and you'll hear more about that, the same things we've been doing matter more than ever. Um, my old boss, uh, Doug Kreidler, from the Columbus Foundation, wrote a column in the dispatch, and he used the words, you know how we've been saying it's not really social distancing, it's physical distancing. Uh, but he talked about social yearning in a time of physical distancing. Um, and he talked about the arts and the way they can help soothe us. I can tell you that I myself, over Easter weekend, had my first time standing outside. And I came home to my house during all of this and found four of my close friends wearing masks, very socially distanced, planting some pansies in my yard. And I talked to them at a distance and it was the first conversation with them I'd had in months. Um, and I realized over the holiday and when the holiday ended that I was feeling all the same Groundhog Day feelings again. The anger, the frustration, the despair. Why don't we know more? Why do we still have to learn so much more to have the answers we want to give you? How much more do we have to tolerate of this? And I just want to acknowledge that all of us are feeling this. It's such an unprecedented time that is asking a sort of a marathon of response from us. So we're gonna have good days and bad days. We're gonna have anger. We're gonna wanna give up and just hope that it could go back to the old way it was. And we know that we're moving into a new world. It isn't the old way. But we're moving forward. And we're gonna move forward together. And we're gonna move forward smartly in this state. But I wanna share with you that um, there is a song out there um, it was on the Colbert first show, he first revealed it, uh, by Michael Stipe of REM, wrote a song called, There's No Time for Love Like Now. And it was one of those bittersweet songs that remind me that I have to dig deep over and over again and again 
to feel that love. And so I hope you'll take a look at that song. It's something that's helping me stay connected during this time. Thank you. Dr. Acton, thank you very much.